afternoon everyone uh, welcome to this pan iit 2020 uh, today we are joined by six of our team member across iits who have been working in the healthcare and uh, you know healthcare is something which has never been as critical to human kind as it is post covid and today accessibility affordability and quality of healthcare is something that everyone is worried about as well as the way healthcare progresses as we move uh in the next era post covid and therefore the role of technologists and uh, is going to be as critical as the healthcare workers who have been working be it doctors nurses and so on i won't be surprised if in the next 10 years we have more of engineers working in the healthcare sector and driving the healthcare services as a domain than the number of doctors and uh, nurses and paramedical staff so with that uh, let me welcome you all uh to this panel thank you for being a part of it and today uh, i'll request each one of the panel members to take a couple of minutes to introduce themselves and thereafter we'll talk about the topic which is disrupting healthcare in terms of how the healthcare is moving forward and what do we see both within india and outside india and thereafter we'll have a, again one round of uh, you know couple of minutes to be able to conclude that so with that uh you know may i uh, request Rashi, to start the introduction, please. Hi, everyone. It's great to be part of this panel. So, quick introduction on myself. Uh, I am from IIT Kanpur. Graduated in two thousand nine. Did my biotech engineering, and uh, serendipitously, in the last eleven years of my career, I've worked in healthcare in many different roles. Started on the investing finance side in healthcare. and then moved on to in uh, doing uh, an operational role in biocon where i launched a cancer drug uh, in the us uh, for breast cancer and then after my mba from wharton decided it was time to take the plunge and start my own company so four years ago me and my co-founder we founded a health tech startup called onco.com which is focused on providing end to end care management to cancer patients uh, with onco our vision was uh, singular we wanted to empower cancer patients and their families with the right information about their treatment so that they can go about about it with confidence and that is exactly what we do today we have built the largest oncology network in india it's an online platform where you can get personalized guidance on your treatment from the comfort of your home and then we manage your care in the offline setting by connecting you to the right stakeholders it's been a fantastic journey and i'm really really happy to be part of this fun thanks dr satyam thank you rashi may i uh, request douglas to be the next well good afternoon um i i will have to say that i have not graduated the esteemed institute of iit and somehow they still let me sneak into the room um i am the ceo of i2cure which is a biotechnology company which was started to address the prevented the preventative and curing of conditions of the skin by isolating molecular iodine and our kind of explosion onto the market uh was just happens to coincide with the pandemic because our therapies actually get absorbed into the skin and then released so we provide continuous long term protection for all the different um surfaces of the skin um my headquarters my global headquarters are, are normally in uh, reston virginia i join you today from gurgaon and uh look forward to this conversation moving forward thank you doug we have co-opted you in the it uh, system uh <laughs> let me uh, then request anu to be the next uh, speaker to introduce herself uh thank you dr satyam and uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh i have uh, been uh, i graduated from iit kharagpur many many years ago almost uh, seems forever we celebrated our 25th anniversary of uh, Lee, i mean of joining kharagpur so it's been a while uh but about uh, after i graduated went to the us uh, and then uh, in 2000 around 97 98 uh, decided to start on my first entrepreneurial venture and in the year 2000 moved back to india 
and started a company in the US, but also in India. Uh, so that was Osimum Bio. And uh, Osimum Bio ended up uh, in a, we started off in a very interesting fashion and we, um, we ended up acquiring three companies outside of uh, India, two in Europe and one in the US. So we became one of the largest genomic services companies worldwide. And uh, one of the assets that we had over there was a database that is used by most large pharmaceutical companies even today for drug discovery. Uh, but one challenge, of course, over there was the fact that there wasn't much Indian data. And that was the reason why I began uh, about seven years ago, began Map My Genome. And Map My Genome is uh, focused on uh, personalized preventive healthcare. And uh, over the last few years, we've been working a lot on um, both in terms of giving people uh, advice on how they can use genetic information and take, uh, make lifestyle changes so that they can actually lead a much more healthier life. But we've also been working a lot in terms of uh, the clinical part of the, uh, of the aspect, especially on oncology and, and, and uh, mother and child care. And very recently, of course, we've also become the COVID uh, company because everybody comes to many of many people are now coming to us for testing both in our office, but also at the airport in Hyderabad. Thank you, Anu. That's really nice. Uh, let me request Sumit to be the next to introduce himself. Uh, thank you, Satyam, and thank you to Sanjeev and Rohit in terms of organizing a fabulous um, Pan IIT conference. Um, I'm delighted to be here. I'm Sumit Jamwar. I'm the uh, co-founder and chief executive of uh, Global Gene Corp, um, uh, organization that I co-founded along with another IIT friend uh, from IIT Delhi. Um, we are very excited about genetics and the possibilities. And just adding on to what Anu was saying, uh, given it, the exceptional opportunity that genetics has presented itself in terms of transforming our lives and personalizing our entire life experience, uh, the question we, we ask ourselves is, you know, can we make 70 the new 40 um, and give us that, that very healthy, productive life experience going forward by using the information that is coded in our DNA? Um, and how would that enable us to leapfrog healthcare everywhere? Because the traditional model is something which is broken and it's unlikely to succeed, especially when we look at India. Um, and so, you know, how can we bring that revolution going forward? Uh, the big challenge in genetics is the fact that there is, you know, on one hand, we are looking to personalize everything around individuals. On the other hand, we do not have the foundation either in terms of understanding of different ethnicities and subpopulations or indeed diseases. Uh, because 80% of all data, uh, genetic data comes from people of European ancestry. And that's the problem we have been solving over the last um, eight years, which is mapping and organizing the world's genomic diversity uh, to ensure that each one of us can enjoy a high quality life and the longevity benefits that come with it. Um, I uh, went to, I'm a chemical engineer from IIT Delhi. And uh, I also had the privilege of staying on the campus because my father uh, was a professor. Um, at IIT Delhi, and so um, it's it's been a very privileged upbringing in terms of being surrounded by ideas and uh, some exceptional people who, with whom we have learned from. And we were very fortunate to be recognized more recently with the Roddenberry Prize for 2020, which is a million dollar prize given to four organization and he won it in science. Uh, so which which was a great recognition to come in. Uh, again, delighted to be here and contributing to the, to the panel. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you, Sumit. We are uh, pleased to have you here. Let me request Mayu to be the next. Uh, thank you, Dr. Satyam. Um, I, I think um, uh, I'd like to sort of start my, my sort of uh, introduction by saying uh, my name is Mayur Sardesai. Uh, I graduated from uh, IID Bombay in 1987 uh, with a degree in chemical engineering. Uh, still associated fairly actively with the IID Bombay because I serve on the board of the Alumni Association of IID Bombay and also associated with uh, the incubators at IIT Bombay, like Sign, which is the business incubator and technology incubator and Betic, which is the med tech incubator. So spent a lot of time still at, at on the campus in terms of sort of uh, reaching out to faculty, industry, uh, students in, in terms of engaging them in, especially in the healthcare sp uh, space. Um, my background is, so right now I'm the, I, I'm the founding partner of a healthcare private equity fund called Somerset Industry Capital Partners. Uh, we've been running this fund over the last nearly a decade now. Uh, we uh, we formed this fund about 2011. Uh, the intent was to sort of focus on product and services platforms 
which provide access to affordable quality healthcare in India. Saying so, uh, what we look for is, is promoters who, who can build businesses uh, predominantly in lower tier markets and create sustainable impact. Uh, and we believe that there's a huge opportunity in the lower tier markets in India. And that's something which uh, is, is a great focus for us in, 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 our, in our business. Um, as far as uh, my background, uh, I think after IIT, I, I went to the US for about six years with my master's and MBA there. Uh, came back and then have been in healthcare pretty much for over 25 years now. Uh, have done various roles, um, uh, worked with uh, companies like German Remedies and business development. But my family being from the pharmaceutical space, sort of got into pharma, uh, ran a successful contract manufacturing business in, uh, where build plant, runs plant, formulation plants. Uh, we've got into uh, the whole um, uh, marketing space in, in, in pharma. After that, I actually sold that business and, and built IMS Health Consulting Business in India for about five years. Uh, and, and after that, before we formed the fund, uh, ran a couple of startups, one in the area of dental stem cell banking and research, and the other area is uh, the Israeli medtech product space. So excited to be on this, pa on this panel. I think uh, uh, the panel members have a vast experience in various areas of healthcare, and it'll be a good discussion to sort of be in. Thank you. Thank you, Mayur. Uh, let me request Rashi uh, uh, Jayashree to be uh, the last one to uh, introduce herself. Of course, you will be the last panelist, but then I'm left, so I'll introduce myself after you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Satyam. It is indeed a pleasure to be part of this multifaceted panel. Uh, I'm Jayashree Kanthar. Uh, and I've recently co-founded uh, Enzia Ventures, an early stage fund focused on health and sustainability. Uh, we are at our early stages, uh, having made three seed investments and uh, planning to raise the larger fund uh, in uh, 2021. Uh, prior to this, I worked with uh, Khazana and IHH Healthcare. Uh, Kazana is the Malaysian Sovereign Wealth Fund and IHH Healthcare is the largest hospital chain in Asia. Uh, so large, uh, largely been actively involved in making some large uh, private equity investments in healthcare. Uh, invested in Apollo Hospitals, uh, the top two of the three large pharma companies in India. Uh, while working at IHH is when I realized the dearth of tech in healthcare and hence the genesis of NCR Ventures. Um, so very excited about the potential of digital health, health tech in the coming five to 10 years. Um, and I'm also an alum of IIT Bombay, 2005 pass out, um, and an alum of ISB Hyderabad and McKinsey. Uh, so yeah, excited uh, to be part of this panel. Thank you. Thank you, Jayashree. Uh, you know, it's my honor to be a part of this panel and to be able to moderate this discussion. So introduce myself. I am Satyam Shivan Sundaram. I I'm from IIT Madras, uh, did my dual degree uh, in engineering, uh, in civil engineering from IIT Madras, graduated in 2003, then worked for a few years in the infrastructure sector, landed up at IIM Ahmedabad with my PhD, had a couple of PhD students at IIM Indore when I was a professor, and then suddenly moved to consulting. And last 10 years, I've been with ENY as a partner in uh, healthcare uh, you know, domain where I've been leading the healthcare from the policy perspective. So great to have, uh, you know, people from technology research as well as fund funding and policy domain to be on this panel and to be able to discuss the uh, disruptions in the healthcare that we see. Uh, let me go back to uh, the, uh, you know, in terms of panel to Rashi Bat and considering her background uh, in the healthcare and uh, her understanding of the National Digital Health Mission in India and the technology uh, panning out uh, in the healthcare over a period of time. Uh, may I request Rasi to uh, you know, talk about how you see uh, healthcare panning out as we move post in the post-COVID era? Sure, thanks Satya. So um, I'll sort of uh, talk about a few macro themes that you know, we have observed emerge uh, in India in the last few years. So. One of the things that we realized when we founded Onco was that when it came to healthcare delivery, we were fundamentally living in a pre-internet era when it came to giving patient the experience of getting healthcare, right? Uh, you went to one 
hospital, you've got care under one doctor. And what we've seen emerge in the last five years is a lot of technology platforms that are sort of integrating this offline ecosystem that exists, making it accessible to patient online. And one of the big, biggest themes that we've seen emerge is that people have access to internet. Uh, digital penetration has gone to hinterlands now. And there is this the data is cheap and there's this wonderful opportunity to create a lot of technology enabled models that can solve the traditional gaps that exist in healthcare, including accessibility, where people traditionally who did not have access to specialists can now uh, through their smartphones, through some of the tech apps that are available to them, get advice from quality doctors and affordability as well, because uh, technology enabled solutions for the first time are actually bringing in price transparency and bringing in more optionality to customers to choose where they want to get treated. And this is something that really excites me. I think uh, the question that you uh, pose around how things have changed post COVID is an interesting one. Uh, from our own experience, what I can tell you is that one of the biggest things that uh, COVID did was it forced a lot of people who were otherwise extremely skeptical of using technology solutions to choose technology uh, I can speak about cancer patients. Traditionally, a cancer patient would not consider having a teleconsultation with an oncologist. They would fundamentally travel thousands of miles just to meet an expert. But COVID posed new challenges and we saw a lot of people uh, opting for teleconsultation solutions. And the most interesting trend that I have seen emerge is also on the acceptance of technology on the physician side. I have seen a lot of doctors and providers who were otherwise probably uh, skeptical of whether being on tech platforms or not. I have seen a wider acceptance of senior oncologists, senior specialists now coming on these platforms and being available for their customers. So the whole, so we are experiencing a paradigm shift. And I think the next five, six years are going to be really, really interesting for healthcare because we're going to see technology enabled solutions become more mainstream. Thank you, Rashi. Uh, let me uh, invite Doug uh, in terms of his international experiences around technology enablement itself, and as well as talk about a little more uh, in terms of his specific areas around biotechnology. Doug? Well, th thank you. Um, and I, I, I failed to mention uh, in the introduction that prior to founding um, I2Cure, I integrated uh, emerging technologies sourced from the uh, California Bay Area, the Silicon Valley, bringing them east, eastward uh, for the US government's use. So <clears throat> very experienced in the high tech world. Um, let me first talk about um, my technology and then our vision of a pre and post COVID world. Uh, I think everyone who is viewing this has some experience with iodine in their life. We were talking on the panel prior to going live that as young boys, the war paint of having our wounds dressed with iodine and having all the different stains all over, all over our body was a uh, badge of honor. Well, that iodine that people are very familiar with that they have interacted with either at the hospital or at their doctor's office is a very large amount of iodine species and a tiny, tiny, tiny amount, like five parts per million of the active, which is molecular iodine. And what we have done is by stabilizing that active, that molecular iodine, and only using that part, instead of having five parts per million, we have 1500 parts per million non-staining, non-irritating, non-toxic iodine with the capability of it being absorbed into the skin and then outgassed as a vapor protecting our skin. And it's that protection which we view the pre and post COVID environment because everyone understands how um, quickly this particular disease spread. And I'm here to say that in the post COVID environment, the one very disturbing prediction I can make 
is that uh, disease is always going to be with us. And there's going to be additional diseases that have been, that are going to be novel, which we're going to have to address maybe in another 50 years, 100 years, but they tend to uh, present themselves. And the pre-COVID environment was one in which having your hands clean or your face clean was something that you felt comfortable doing right before you sat down for a meal. So you would um, put hand sanitizer or wash your hands before a meal and you felt comfortable. So where we are with COVID in the, in the post period, um, I think so, I, I, I don't wanna steal somebody's uh, uh, thunder from our prior discussion, but someone coined, wasn't me, please uh, identify yourself when it's your turn. But instead of BC as for before Christ, now it's BC before COVID, um, we now have to protect ourselves from what we're going to touch. So if we can keep the spread um, from, a from uh, be being rampant, where we can keep the spread very minimal, um, when these types of diseases present themselves, uh, we will have much more um, runway, much more lead time to get in front of them before they can really cause the kind of damage that uh, we have seen um, COVID do around the globe and especially in the US. So uh, I, I can tell you, we launched here in India um, in, in September and we are seeing pretty re just remarkable results as it relates to that kind of protection where doctors who are working in these COVID wards um, are remaining healthy while other doctors that we're familiar with um, have been sickened. And it seems like our product is spreading quite quickly here in, in India in the healthcare world. So you know, I'm much different on this panel from a platform, you know, technology and COVID really kind of are, are escalating and really moving the fourth generation industrial revolution forward in a very robust, fast pace. Um, my technology is really at the point of care and having a technology that can protect the spread of disease while the other technologies which are here represented in the panel can get ahead of these diseases um, in a very robust way while uh, point of care, if you will, is slowing down the, the march forward. Thank you, Doug. That's a, a really great insight. Uh, let me uh, next ask Anu, uh, given her uh, you know, background and understanding to talk about a little more in terms of how she sees the behaviors changing in terms of people seeking healthcare itself and what that would mean for all of us as technology uh, enabling uh, you know, entities to be able to serve them in terms of accessibility, affordability, and quality of healthcare. Over to you, Anu. Thank you. Uh, so I think first, let me take the credit for the BC and PC. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> uh, since, since Doug did good. ask me to take it, right? Uh, so I would, uh, you know, I have been in genomics for 20 years, and I think one of the things I want to put all these pieces of the puzzle that I'm talking about today would be through my, um, you know, in some ways anecdotal, but also trying to put together some of the data. So I, I guess both Sumit and me talked about one key element that was data uh, in terms of different populations. The other is of course the science uh, that has changed tremendously both, and I'll, I'll speak mostly from a genomic lens, but this is true of most of healthcare as well. Uh, and the third, of course, is uh, accessibility uh, and affordability, as well as finally, I think the most important part is that we see of behavior change. Now, when we look at the science, um, I remember about 20 years ago when we just started off on bioinformatics and, and trying to look at drug discovery, I think often I would meet up people who would say, well, I never saw a computer make a drug. 
So all that you're doing is all rubbish, right? I mean, uh, so I think from that time where it was, uh, you know, it was something that a lot of research scientists put together to today, when you look at what the US FDA is approving in terms of drugs, you'll find that there is more than 45% of the drugs that are personalized drugs. So I think in the last 20 years, we have come a long way in terms of what has happened with the kind of uh, approvals that are happening globally. The second thing is, of course, that when you look at the science itself, you look at what you did when, um, when I first went to the US in 95, 96, I think most of you know, my roommates were, bio I mean, some of my friends were biologists and they would run gels throughout the night. You know, that was a typical way of how you would, you would get data. And then you moved on to getting small sequences. You did sequ Sanger sequencing and all of that. And I think basically that essentially meant that you had little pieces of data of the human genome but you had to put a lot of software and a lot of computation that could put together all these pieces of the puzzle together. Today, I think you can get a whole genome done and that used to cost a few billion dollars 20 years ago. And today we are at a, at a price point where it is, you know, you can get a genome sequence done, you know, in less than a thousand dollars. So I think, and a typical uh, regular test can be, you know, $10 to a few hundred dollars. So I think there has been a a great change in terms of what the science itself can do because the kind of equipment that you get today are have become almost as simple as saying you know I can plug and play and get the, the data for a, for somebody and that was definitely not the case earlier so the science has definitely improved tremendously we've also seen that you know the cost or the affordability of these tests have come down so much that it's now in within the reach of an average uh, person at the same time, I would say that in a country like India, I think we are still a few, maybe a year or so away from where it can become uh, available to everybody. And I think part of that problem is not the fact that, you know, this can't be accessible by a lot of people because this can be accessible. People do order a test and most of these are do it yourself. And that has allowed a lot more people to access these kind of tests across the globe. But when you look at accessibility, I think we assume that, you know, at least the population that at least has access to mobile phones or has access to computers can order something like this. So I think in order to make the access better, uh, we have to make sure that this is available in every little town and village and so that they're able to access, uh, you know, new, uh, new sort of uh, developments like this that is there. And of course, I think the, the, uh, the value in putting all of these pieces of the puzzle together has have to be triggered by something that actually makes a big change in terms of the knowledge of the consumers. So I remember when we started off uh, seven years ago, I think we had to resort to Bollywood and cricket because we really didn't, you know, we, one, we named our product Genome Patri because we said at least people understand what a Genome Patri is. And therefore, you know, they could sort of relate to what a Genome Patri is. But then we resorted to things like, um, you know, Mera Juta Hai Japani, Ye Patlu in English Tani. Uh, but my genes are Hindustani. So uh, focusing on the fact that, you know, your genes are determined by the fact that you are in a specific population. From there to today, where you have come, and I think this has been the biggest trigger that the pandemic has caused, is the fact that people are way more aware than they were in the past. So what we do see is that I think because of, you know, the COVID tests available across the country and COVID tests also having become extraordinarily affordable, I think that has improved the knowledge base of the, of the regular person so much so that it allows people to be able to at least have a meaningful discussion with someone and they don't feel uh, worried about, you know, having an awkward moment uh, in terms of what they want from you. So I think that these four pieces together, the data that you now have a lot more data from different populations, and also from a lot of different research studies that puts together all these multiple information together. The second, of course, being uh, the science, which has improved tremendously. The third is being accessible. And fourth is making sure it is affordable. But the most important thing is where we saw the behavior change because of the knowledge that people had gotten, but also because I think doctors finally got used to using their mobile phones for doing the consults. They also got used to ordering a lot of things online. And I think that has driven a lot of changes and we'll start seeing this not just in genomics, but we'll see this in, in across health tech because I think that's where we are going to see an aggregation of data. We are going to see a lot more 
consumerization of this information on uh, in health and we'll start seeing that this is the direction that we will uh, see a lot more future inventions as well as a lot of uh, uh, applications and various other things happening so with that i'll i'll stop for now thank you anu uh, that's a great uh, insight and thanks for the uh, bc and uh, pc construct uh, once again we acknowledge that and uh, you know going forward i can't have anybody better than uh, sumit to talk about technology who has not only studied in iit but has been born and brought up in the technology environment so sumit over to you to talk about a little more uh, in terms of technology as you see it and taking it further in your area of uh, genomics and genetics uh, thank you um uh, satyam uh, so look i'll just uh, add on to what the panelists have said and i think you know um if i look at the biggest change which has happened pre covid and post covid is that um the, you know as anu said it's the adoption of technology right and the way we use technology on everyday basis if i go specifically to what we are seeing in genetics you know pre covid if i talk to someone the average person on the street and said i you know they ask you what you did and you talked about genomics you know they would go oh wow and that's where it would stop because it was scientific mainstream right now it has captured people's imagination so now what you get is a very engaged conversation because people are tracking what's happening with vaccines with the creation and with everything else that's going on um it's it so it's moved in some ways it's what happened to the internet you know in the late 90s where it became from a scientific you know collaborative tool to something which became mainstream and i think that's the fundamental shift that we're seeing which is going to accelerate everything that's going on um the second um a aspect where it manifested itself is uh which is an area we are very active in is you know when you look at the convergence of of genetics which is sequencing as as again what anu said what costed about just over 15 years ago costed 2.7 billion dollars took 13 years um to convert that information in every cell into a machine readable book of life uh now costs a few hundred dollars and takes a few hours that's a fundamental transformation and the cost is still going to go down the second trend which has happened is uh, which again as technologists we understand and you know being uh, uh, it, it, it is the whole trend about the compute infrastructure and the data sciences so artificial intelligence cloud compute etc so on a cloud compute platform the ability to you as we have so much information and we have to compare and find patterns across other 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 people uh, people's data uh, the ability to have that infrastructure which actually cost us almost nothing you can pay for it over a credit card is an absolutely phenomenal convert you know trend which is coming to place and when you converge those two uh, there is a uh, there are business models which are changing there are use cases which are accelerating and i'll quote one of them which we are actively involved in is you look at therapeutics right a typical therapeutic to create a drug when it goes into phase 1 you know so overall the in pharma industry spends close to 200 billion dollars um uh, you know in in terms of uh a pharma r&d uh when you put something in phase 1 the chance of success is less than you know is about 8% so not over 90% failure uh, the typical time to develop that takes 10 to 15 years um and uh, it costs about 2 billion dollars on an average to get a drug out there now when you add biomarkers and genomics the success rate moves from 8% to about 26% on an average and even higher in some cases uh, the the time can crunch to maybe a third or a fourth of that which is from 10 to 15 years it comes to 3 to 4 years and the cost goes from 2 billion dollars to about a billion dollars because you have faster failures and when you succeed you have a more more robust uh, data data set and evidence to back that up and the, the last time this happened was again the, that it's faster it's better and it's cheaper was again going back to the whole internet time uh, around that so um, and we're seeing it right now because the covid vaccine took us 10 months to deliver a typical vaccine to deliver would have taken us somewhere between 10 to 15 years uh, covid was discovered in december in clinical manifestation in december 2019 2020 it was basically sequenced uh, the genome was sequenced uh, february was when the first vaccine came out um, um, a, and then it was put into trial in march and we have already got approvals and if you compare that to ebola for example which was discovered in 1976 the first sequence was done in 1993 the first vaccine came in 2005 and the approval came in 2019 that's a 15 year cycle 
And that's what is being crunched. And that's where the possibilities of what even Anu referred to, which is, you know, drugs being created when, on computer uh, with the right data set, with the right curated data sets, and being able to run the tools that we have is absolutely phenomenal. So that's a transformation we are seeing. And the, 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 the point I wanted to then get into is why I'm excited is a simple example from India, which the Institute, you know, CSIR and Institute of Genomics and Integrated Biology, led by Dr. Anurag Agarwal, what they created with the Feluda test, uh, which is the COVID testing tool. So rather than the standard RPCR, you created a test which was um, which used CRISPR um, and uh, is available to the masses and can test COVID in one hour when you have, um, you know, um, from it's a paper-based test, which says whether you're COVID positive or not. And those are the transformations and innovations that are coming out of, that we are all looking forward to and participating in across India, which can then roll out to the rest of rest of the world. Because once you once you solve for India, you solve for the rest of the world. And the, the final point I wanted to just leave on is, look, and which is where the um, IIT heritage, it plays a massive role is, when you're doing deep science, we need the ability to go back to what I, you know, the, the first Delta principles. So we need a team which is, uh, which is an expert or a team of experts who know what they, they're doing. They are deeply passionate about what they do and they can break down any problem to that, to, 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 the, to the basics. Because in an emerging field, which is evolving and evolving really rapidly, if we don't have the ability as a team, as an organization, as a as a nation, to break things down to first delta, uh, we will we will be following rather than leading the the, the, the leading the science and leading the discoveries. So, the one thing I'm really fortunate and privileged to enjoy is, you know, my other two co-founders were at Harvard. They are some of the best known folks in 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 genomics. One of them has got a discovered a disease which was named after him. Um, you know, and they are leading things, and they're also clinicians who lead the way. So when we go to them and, you know, it doesn't matter if I have an IIT education or not, there is no way I will be able to understand as much as they do about genetics. But what we do do is bring in different cross, you know, aspects. And as an engineer, one thing you're trained off is it's a system. And, you know, we have dealt with really complicated systems. So the question is, how can we, how can we look at the system and say, and sometimes not coming from the, not being a doctor is helpful because you bring in a different perspective from different industries to solve for that. So I think my final point is about talent and it's about team. And I think that's where the huge opportunity again in this pan IIT setting is, is, is that, you know, we, I'm, I'm delighted what Anu is doing, what we are doing, what Rashi uh, and Jeshri and others are doing, because what we're doing is we're creating an ecosystem where we are basically being a talent multiplier. We are training people in you know, my team based in Welcome Genome Campus at Sanger Institute, or something that uh, Anu referred to where the f first human genome project happened. You know, they're world-class. They combined with some amazing talent that we have graduating from India. When you build that ecosystem or we look at the Boston ecosystem where Jonathan is in, actually leads things forward. And that's a collaboration that again, post COVID that's happening more and more actively, but that's fundamental uh, to, to bu building the pool and adopting deep technology. I'll just pause there. Thank, thank you again. Thanks, Sumit, for that wonderful insight. Uh, you know, based on what I hear uh, all of you talk about is the technology is going to be driving a lot more in terms of the diagnostic side and how quickly things would change. So I can't have anybody better than Mayur to talk about molecular diagnostics and as well as to lead us into what kind of investments are going to come in to healthcare in particular. And then if time permits, you know, pan a little more around this digital healthcare system in India as he sees. So Mayur, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Satyam. So I think I, I'd, I'd like to sort of start with the healthcare ecosystem itself in India and sort of define it a little bit differently. Uh, I think the more we look at healthcare in India, I think the definition of India and Bharat plays out very well. You've got the metro and tier one towns which sort of define India and what happens there, the traditional models in healthcare. And I think the Bharat piece is all the lower tier towns and it, it's a completely different sort of ecosystem which works there. Uh, there is very less accessibility, there is very less affordability, uh, very little doctors, very little infrastructure on the ground. And how do you deliver healthcare at that point? I think uh, a lot of focus and, and resources and energy goes in sort of 
putting the traditional models together, scaling them up and building them, and that's important. But I think when you move to the next tier of towns, I think the critical part is to understand, you know, how do you deal with these dynamics? And, and there, I think a lot uh, which I see playing out is that you have to bring accessibility and affordability by very different standards as compared to what you see in, in traditional models. The traditional models are, are all based on, you know, doctors being there, uh, infrastructure and healthcare delivery being there, diagnostic services being there on the spot, and that too in, in, in more physical form. I think when you move down there, I think all that is probably uh, less than 10, 15% of what you see in, 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 in the bigger towns. And that's where technology plays a big, big role. I think uh, you have to use technology to basically provide that access. Uh, you have to basically uh, use technology to create the reach to, uh, to, the, to the lower tier population. Also, I think what has happened in the last probably three, four years and, and probably since 2014, 15, uh, is, is the advent of the payer mechanism. India has been a self-pay market all throughout. And whatever models we've built are based on a self-pay model. And that's why you see most of the models being more curative in nature. They're related to treatment, not related to preventive care, primary care, because healthcare is a negative need at the end of the day. I mean, you don't go unless you require. It's not a positive need where you want to spend money on. Reimbursement mechanisms allow for more, more sort of uh, primary care, preventive care. And I think health insurance is moving in that direction in metro tier one towns. I think you've seen a lot more uh, health insurance playing out, health insurance growing at about 30% plus. But I think the whole space of the government and the Ayushman Bharat scheme, I think that will play a significant impact in terms of creating affordability. I think whether it is on the curative side, which is going on now, or the preventive side, which we start, we started seeing offshoots coming in. I think that's the real play which will which will hold hold steam. And the key is to see how do we work in terms of a payer mechanism, how do we see in terms of the digital play, and how do we will build business models around that. I think that's the critical part uh, in, in in that space. Now, when I look at diagnostics, I'll give you an example of one of our portfolio companies. It's a company called Krishna Diagnostics, which most people haven't heard of, but it's probably the largest player in the lower tier markets in diagnostics. Does over 5 million scans a year in, in CT and MRI scans, but completely done on a technology backbone working across 16 plus states in the country. And that's possible because there is a PPP model in place. There is a government payer in place. There's technology available in terms of teleradiology, which allows for this kind of thing. And I think there are many more disruptive models coming in, in, in that direction. Also, I think digital health, uh, there were three sort of barriers to sort of growth in digital health. I think one was the penetration of internet. Second was the adoption of doctors. And the third was a payer mechanism because a lot of the digital health play is around primary care and, and sort of uh, early stage care. I think the payer mechanism at the uh, lower tier markets is slowly being looked at. We are also seeing offshoots in the healthcare insurance system of OPD insurance coming in. And it's slowly starting to mirror the Western model of, of insurance. I think that that is taking care of the payer model. Internet penetration is, is already happening. But I think COVID, the biggest thing which COVID did, and, and this is something which we've probably broken our heads over the last so many years to say, how do doctors adopt to this? I think doctors never adopted to technology because in India, with the dearth of doctors, you have 200 people sitting outside your clinic. Why do you really need to go into digital health? And, and, and that was the sort of uh, always the rationale given by a doctor to say why I wouldn't adopt. I think fast forward COVID, I think that whole thing has changed. Doctors are ready to engage with patients on that way. Doctors are ready to engage with other stakeholders like pharma companies, med tech companies, other stakeholders. And that's changed the entire ecosystem. I think that that fast forwards uh, our healthcare uh, practice in, uh, by probably four or five years. And I think that's that's something which we are we are seeing. We're very hopeful mm -hmm. for that. And I think all this whole COVID situation has has brought out sort of areas of preventive care which probably were five five ten years away. Uh, nutrition focused on nutrition, focused on preventive care, 
focused on molecular diagnostics, which you sort of men mentioned, right? I mean, uh, focus on digital health. All these things were were something which you know you hoped would go and and sort of build over a period of time. I think that that play is there is is coming in. Even molecular diagnostics. I think advanced diagnostics was something which was hardly heard of even in 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 metro and tier one towns. Forget about lower tier towns. I think uh, the kind of capacity we built in RT PCR and point of care testing uh, uh, in, in in terms of both PCR and other forms. I think is is tremendous and. It will hold good not just for COVID, but I think it hold good for the entire healthcare okay system going forward. And 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 what do you want in the population at the end of the day? You you don't want people going for uh, treatments and curative care. I think you want preventive care to really take take shape. And I think all digital health, uh, 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 diagnostics, nutrition, all this put together, I think basically allows our country to now start looking at that space. In, 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 in a manner where it will impact healthcare in a very, very different manner. So I think we're moving from a very curative self-pay model uh, uh, to a much more preventive uh, uh, payer-based mechanism, uh, which will be outcomes driven. I think no longer, and I think things like the NDHM health stack, which the government is working on, et cetera, the intent is to increase efficiencies in the system. I think all these efficiencies, if you put together with the payer mechanism, you will have a very, very strong system going forward. But I think the opportunity which lies here is what can you do to create these differentiated business models? Because the traditional business models may not work in this new ecosystem. And I think the, the, the real test is how do you use new technologies, new areas to our growth to really create these new models in place. And I think the winners in, in the next few years will be these kind of companies and organizations who basically look at the, the non-traditional models to build out in healthcare. I think that's, that's what I, I feel will happen. Thank you. Thank you, Mayur. I think a great point that you brought on uh, out-of-pocket expenditure. Indeed, India is very high, uh, above 60% or so even today. And I'm sure policymakers are working towards that. And with technology, that's one area we will definitely be able to change. And your second idea around preventive and promotive care taking over uh, and becoming uh, the front focus now is really indeed uh, remarkable. Let me move to Jayashree that with these kind of changes with uh, you know technology, with the behavioral changes, with the uh, you know uh, health seeking behavior itself changing, how do you see the funding pattern in healthcare moving? And what do you see happening in the next five to 10 years uh, from the lens of a you know funding agency or uh, you know, guys interested in financing their care. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Satya. Uh, so I think um, just touching upon some of the global trends, right? Um, if you look at uh, the largest tech companies, uh, Apple, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, uh, over forty percent of their investments are in digital health. Um, 17% of the venture exits in 2019 were from health tech globally, right? So globally, digital health uh, has been a wave for the past five years. Uh, if we look at India's strengths in healthcare, India has been the largest exporter uh, of pharma after US, uh, and that's been our uh, strength. Um, and also the exporter of talent, right? Um, some of the surgeries which cost um, 100 in India cost 10 times uh, globally. So India, uh, our innate strength has been talent and our low cost of healthcare. Uh, and so that is our position of power as we look at digital health because there is a huge uh, potential to make from India for global um, and uh, as we look at health tech in India, right, uh, I think some of, ah, okay, sorry. So I was saying uh, some of the tailwinds we are seeing which are accelerating this health tech uh, wave in India is one, we are seeing very promising founding teams. Um, so I've been investing in healthcare since 2008. So earlier, while you could see, um, you know, pure techies or pure clinical teams coming, now you're seeing very rounded teams with a good combination of tech technology as well as clinical knowledge coming to play, right? 
Uh, second is we're seeing very good regulatory tailwinds. In India, if you look at the recent e-pharmacy bill or the NBHM regulations, all these are laying very good foundations from a regulatory perspective. And third, obviously, COVID has been uh, a very good tailwind in terms of accelerating some of the behavioral challenges uh, that we had anyways foreseen. Right? So I think there are very strong tailwinds now. Uh, as we look at uh, digital health, uh, Satyam, some of the interesting themes, um, uh, promising themes we find are one, theoretic led full stack models, right? Um, like Rashi is working on Onco.com or look at the flatter on uh, acquisition by Roche. Um, so oncology being one, women health, uh, women's health being another uh, big theme. We made some investments in that in Proactive for Her and iMums. So uh, this whole theoretic led business models we find very interesting because globally, if you look at the healthcare profit pools, 60%, more than 60% of the profit pools are with pharma companies, right? So I think these therapeutic led business models see very good potential for exits from the large pharma companies. And hence we find these very interesting. And also the uh, very, um, I mean, technology is a very powerful tool to build full stack models in these from diagnostics to services to far, uh, delivering pharma at home. So that is one. Second, uh, like Mayur said, uh, uh, healthcare being a negative need to now being a positive need, right? So this whole preventive health uh, sub-segment, um, and uh, like Anu said, genome patri, right? People now proactively do want to understand what are their innate strengths and weaknesses and be proactive about uh, addressing their health. And COVID, again, has incrementally um, strengthened the need to be preventively health, uh, healthy, rather than reactively curing yourself. And similarly, very bullish on India's strength in alternative medicine, in Ayurveda, uh, I think uh, been less spoken about, but I think it has a huge potential uh, globally done the right way. So that is the second theme. The third theme is around patient-centric models, um, been spoken about a lot. Uh, I think in India, the space is relatively matured as well. If you look at models like PharmEZ or NetMeds, basically empowering the consumer, bringing care closer to the consumer, and technology is a powerful tool uh, to enable that. Uh, and the last but not the least, I think, uh, is a lot of businesses around B2B efficiency. Um, uh, while earlier there was a lot of pressure from the boards and when businesses were seeing the power of tech in other sectors, now I think COVID has made has forced some of the large businesses adopt tech and realize the power of tech, right? So whether it be doctor clinics or hospitals or insurance, uh, I think a lot of models around even EMR as a foundation uh, to plug in other technology, right? So I think some of these are very interesting uh, themes we find. Um, I think there's a lot, lot of opportunity and very bullish uh, about the potential of health tech in the coming five to 10 years. Thanks, Rashi. I think that's a great uh, outline that you have put across in terms of the landscape that we see uh, for the investment. Uh, in the interest of time, as we move, we have got a, quite a few questions. I'll pick two of them and throw it open to the uh, panel and uh, also allow you to make one line rapid fire, uh, you know, final thoughts that you may have as we move towards the closure and hand it over back to uh, Sandeep for his closing uh, uh, you know, remarks. Uh, so the two questions that I want to pick here, one question is around, uh, you know, what are your thoughts related to the discoveries which are happening in the biotechnology sector and how are they getting balanced with the developments in the uh, philosophical underpinning uh, that you see in the society as we go along? A, a quite deep question, uh, may not be a pure techie question, but it's a good question to have uh, for, uh, you know, techies like us. And the second question, uh, which is here, is more to do with the, uh, you know, uh, diagnostics that can we intrinsically and extrinsically identify the, uh, you know, key uh, properties of a plant which can help us cure various diseases. And that's something I think all of you would be interested in uh, quickly touching upon, uh, you know, especially in very, uh, many other areas like agriculture, you already have non-destructive testing. So could we have also something like that for plants? So with these two questions, let me uh, throw it open to all of you. So individually, one by one, please go through your rapid fire one, uh, rapid fire one line. And those of you who wish to respond to the question, please do so. I'll, I'll, the first question 
<clears throat> with the uh, social impact of uh, biotechnology. I think you know there are people that have religious issues as it relates to utilizing certain uh, human sequences, but in the grand scheme of things, when th these technologies are allowing the customization of therapies that target the disease in order for our own bodies to fight against them, very similar to what we're doing with the um, mRNA vaccine for COVID. It's driving down costs and it is uh, proving to be quite effective. I'll quickly take on the plant-based thing. I think most therapeutic drugs uh, also have a plant-based, uh, you know, there are ingredients that are already there in both traditional medicines as well as in, in regular uh, uh, medicines that you see. So it is not a unknown fact. I think the difference really is that for most people, um, what we need to do, for instance, and I think Jayashree touched, touched upon this, that you know, Ayurveda, if done right, is for instance, would be a fantastic thing. And I think that's where maybe it's a good time for India to invest in uh, maybe looking at a lot of the medicinal plants that were uh, that function, but to do it, you know, maybe do a lot more genomics and others to sort of make sure that you can actually uh, understand what is going on and and therefore uh, give a lot more credibility to uh, to the drugs that come out from there. And that's what I would say. But you know, since you asked for one li one liner, I would say that you know, for 20 years I've been told, uh, you know, you are in a sun sun sunrise industry, and I think I have to end it by saying that uh, finally, apna time aage and the sun is finally rising. Great, uh, Mayur uh, Sumit Rashi. Yes, Mayur. I think there are, we are in really exciting times in healthcare, uh, especially in India. I think um, uh, we see growth across the spectrum, uh, whether and, and all, all sort of subsectors of healthcare, whether it is pharmaceuticals, uh, you know, with med tech, uh, diagnostics, uh, delivery, all that. I think there is there is huge amount of capacity building happening both on the product side as well as the services side. Uh, I think lower tier markets are are being accessed and penetrated. I think so that the, that is something which is which is really something which we believe will, will work in India. Um, and, and new technologies are coming of age. I think that that's the critical part, saying that uh, uh, all the panelists who, who work in oncology, in, in genetics, et cetera, I think, like Anu said, your time has come. I think it, it is there, um, models can be built, good businesses can be built. I think it's it's, it's really exciting time for, for healthcare uh, to, to be in right now. Thank you, Mayur. Quick one uh, sentence, Sumit and Rashi. Um, yeah, I, I, I hope we were going to start singing Apna Time Aiga. Uh, I'm very happy to join in. Uh, <laughs> look, I just want to end on saying it's it's really exciting. And, you know, as it, I, I have always believed that technology is a force for good and it impacts the lives of billions. And that's the force multiplier. And we have seen that. Um, the, now, and I would just end by saying we are benefiting and right in the middle of a genomic revolution. And this is the century of genomics. So we are delighted to be contributing at Global Gene Corp in this revolution and also contributing to the infrastructure and capacity building in India and other places that we operate uh, to enable that revolution to be realized. Um, and we would like to thank all the panelists and the panels and, and the partners to be able to do that. So it's really exciting and we're very excited about what the future holds um, over the course of the next few, few years and decades. I'll, I'll just I'll just say that technology has come and revolutionized many industries, whether retail, whether uh, finance, and fundamentally put consumer at its center. But that hasn't happened in healthcare. You know, the way we get care is the same way our grandparents used to get care. Until recently, I think technology-enabled solutions are finally going to make patient the first beneficiary of his own healthcare rather than the last beneficiary as it has been in the past. And that is really exciting. Thanks, Jashri. Any last words before I move to Swadi? Yeah, just uh, two points. I think on the plant fruit, plant based medicine side, um, there's a company globally I admire. Uh, it's based on Chinese medicine called Yuan Sang. Uh, they've done four thousand crore plus of revenues, and I think that's the that's what I'm looking for in Ayurveda in India. Someone who can scale it up to a large level, not just in India but globally as well. 
right? And the, on the second point of apna time uh, aa gaya hai aayega. I think healthcare is a long gestation uh, business as well. So I think this is going to be a way for the next for the coming five to ten years. It isn't a one-year phenomena, uh, right? So very excited about uh, in the coming decade and to invest in some of the promising opportunities and founders. Thank you, Jashri. I won't do the injustice of trying to summarize or bring out the essence out of what we spoke. I think each one of you uh, did a great job of trying to elaborate. Let me go back to Swadeep, uh, who is IIT Madras 2001 batch. Uh, after that, he went to USA, did his PhD from Georgia Tech, uh, and he's a scientist at Chicago and Northwestern. So, uh, you know, over to you, Swadeep. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Satyam. Uh, IIT Madras, same. Uh, actually, we are. Uh, Colleagues there, thank you so much for introducing me and uh, fantastic panel. I mean, one of the best panels I've seen. Uh, I know a couple of you fairly well. In fact, uh, some of you have interacted in the past. Uh, I think you've done a great job of summarizing the whole thing. And I think Anu talking about power of genomics and uh, Mayur talking about primitive medicine and Sumit about the technology. I truly believe uh, I've, I was there in decade in the US and decade here. So I can see the differences. I used to work on remote patient monitoring a, a decade ago. So time, and now is the time when, you know, it's, it's a hundred dollar Fitbit now. It's, it's un, uh, amazing how timing is everything, right? And you're absolutely right on time. You're saying, you know, apna time aega, I think time has come. And COVID actually, we started a disaster support task force called COVID in a campaign. And we saw the regulations for uh, ventilators was not even there. So the government has also woken up. I think the regulations are going to come in place as well. And I think the digital screening tools also are very big, not only AI-based, but also device-based. I can see a lot of quality screening tools on the ground. And I think this is uh, the next decade is India's turn to make it big in healthcare. And we want to uh, wish a thank you, everybody, from PanIT, as well as, uh, uh, you know, we run, of course, Blue Ocean Venture Partners, a healthcare-based advisory firm. But PanIT, th thanks all of you for coming here. And more importantly, I want to thank our sponsors, Kotak Mahindra Bank for sponsoring this whole thing. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Uh, it was indeed a great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.